de vuelta. Yes, well, I, I was saying that in the past it was my great honor to be president and, and secretary general of the American Association of Private International Law, ASADIP. Uh, and since the inception of ASADIP in 2007, SEDEP acts as uh, the seat of its administrative secretariat. SEDEP also seats the Paraguayan chapters of the International Chamber of Commerce and the International Academy of Comparative Law. Together with the latter, it will organize the 2022 Congress in Asuncion after successful editions in Japan, Austria, and the United States. In 2020, SEDEP is commemorating 20 years of existence. In this uh, year, SEDEP conducted joint academic programs with leading universities, among them Georgetown, Bologna, Torquato di Tela, California Western, Heidelberg, and many others. SEDEP is also engaged in significant research projects with positive institutional impact, including proposals of legal reforms per uniform law and um, reordering Paraguayan regulations in several areas such as uh, commerce, investment, energy, and others. Over the years, SEDEP organized several events in North, Central, and South America, inviting local, uh, global and regional jurists in several law areas. One of them, an arbitration conference, gives worldwide attention in leading arbitration circles. SEDEP also advanced several publications with contributions written by renowned legal figures. SEDEP has agreements and collaborations with the renowned organizations, including the Hague Conference on Private International Law, UNIDRAW, and the Organization of American States. Since, since 2006, SEDEP is an observer organization of UNCITRAL, and it was my great privilege to attend the session that year in New York that approved amendments to the arbitration model law. SEDEP's pleasure and honor were to organize, uh, also to organize last year's meeting in Asuncion of the Advisory Council regarding the Uncentral Sales Convention. As known, this highly regarded group of academics has worked for years promoting sound interpretations of this essential Uncentral instrument. Since 2009, SEDEP promotes students' participation in arbitration moot competitions, facilitating them access to legal materials and law professors from all over the world. Paraguayan teams have been excelling in these competitions. Today, many former moot participants positively contribute to the local community's betterment, for instance, promoting arbitration or advancing initiatives of uniform law reform. Thank you uh, very much, Mrs. Secretary and Stefan for your presence today, a stimulus uh, for the work in progress both of SEDEP and ASADIP. And now ASADIP's Vice President, a renowned Edinburgh uh, Law School professor, Veronica uh, Ruiz, a great friend, uh, will pronounce some words on behalf of this uh, wonderful organization. Veronica, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jose, for your warm words. And good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, with great honor that I'm here in representation of the American Association of Private International Law as its Vice President for International Relations. Um, my name is Veronica Ruiz Abunin. As, as Jose said, I'm based at Edinburgh Law School, but I'm originally from Uruguay, and, and I have the, 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 the region, uh, the Latin American region, very much at heart. And uh, on behalf of the American Association of Private International Law, I would like to congratulate SEDEP in its 20 years uh, for the impact that it has had in the region and internationally. Uh, the work of ASADIP uh, could not be possible without the support of SEDEP. SEDEP has been vital uh, in the support of, of ASADIP's work throughout uh, ASADIP's life. And ASADIP, um, is engaged in the promoting private international law in the region and also promoting the vision of uh, Latin American and, and American private international law internationally and globally through its participation in the Hague Conference, but also collaboration with other international organizations and precisely UNCITRAL. And we are delighted to uh, uh, to 
share our excitement for uh, the, the collaboration uh, with UNCITRAL uh, in, in its current work. So it is with great honor that I welcome uh, the uh, and, and Joven and Professor Stefan Kroll. And uh, I uh, would like to invite you all to engage and uh, and participate in this uh, with promises to be a very inspiring session this afternoon. And um, with, with that and with the, uh, with the gratefulness of the American region uh, in, in, in our hearts is that I would like to uh, give the floor to you uh, and Juven. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, first of all, uh, to the organizers, to Veronica Ruiz uh, for ASADIP and to uh, Jose Antonio Moreno Rodriguez, the director of SEDEP, for having me. And uh, also an accolade to uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Kroll, um, who's uh, very active in Vienna and uh, also more recently online to organize the uh, Willem Wismut uh, in, uh, that takes place every year. So uh, thank you very much for having us uh, here. Uh, I'm saying us because I'm joined here by my colleague Marianella Bruno Polero, who is also from Uruguay and also has uh, the Latin American region uh, very close to her heart. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, these opening remarks to brief you very quickly about what Ansifal has been doing uh, in the most recent year. And also maybe for those who don't know us um, in, in the audience, uh, simply to remind you that Ansifal is one of the two uh, legislative bodies of the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, on the one hand, you have the uh, International Law Commission that is dealing, I would say, roughly with public international law, and we are dealing roughly with private international law, and more specifically with international trade and, and business law. Uh, when ANSICRAL was established in 1966, it was mandated to remove and reduce obstacles to international trade through uh, what is uh, a quote from the General Assembly's decision at that time, the progressive harmonization and unification of the law of international trade. And to this end, uh, we have different functions that we are carrying out, uh, and some of them are particularly relevant for today's uh, opening remarks. Uh, first, we, we have a um, coordinating work for all the organizations that are active in international, private international law and international trade law. And uh, we are, one of our roles is to encourage uh, closer cooperation with and among them. And of course, in areas uh, such as uh, private international lawmaking, it involves UNIDRA and the Hague Conference. But on other areas, we are working, for example, very closely with arbitration centers, with uh, ICSID, which is the uh, uh, dispute settlement uh, convention for investment disputes, um, and with the PCA, which is established in the Hague. So there is. Uh, one of our roles is really to, to ensure that there is coordination uh, in the role, the lawmaking and in also in its application. And the second uh, part is of our role that I, I think is particularly relevant for today's uh, opening remarks is our role to promote wider participation in existing international conventions uh, and a wider acceptance of model and uniform laws uh, by states. And of course, the, the, the broader use of unsecured instruments across the board. So this promotion of wider participation in, uh, by states in existing international conventions and wider acceptance of existing model and uniform laws is of course essential for our mandate. Uh, in practice, if, if you think about it, harmonization and unification uh, only produces its effect when more countries become parties to our convention. 
And when governments enact the laws, uh, enact laws and regulations based on our model laws, or when private parties apply our contractual texts in their business transactions. So a clear example of harmonization is, of course, the increased use of the answer trial arbitration rules um, in every uh, part of the world for the settlement of a broad range of disputes, being uh, disputes between private uh, commercial parties, investor state disputes, state to state disputes, and um, commercial disputes administered by arbitral institutions. The Secretariat partners uh, in, in its role for, for dissemination with international organizations such as ASABIP and SEDEP. And of course, uh, we, we very keenly take part every year in the uh, opening and in the, the work of the organization of the WILMC, this international commercial arbitration route to promote our texts. Uh, William Viss being one of my predecessors here as uh, Secretary of Antitrust. So we're very grateful for these partnerships, which have um, raised awareness and promoted um, a better understanding and use of our texts by legal practitioners, by judges, arbitrators, students, of course, and members of academia and the public in general. So this partnership has been particularly instrumental, and I should say that and underline, underline it uh, in the case of Paraguay, because Paraguay is one of our champion countries uh, that has enacted most of Ansipar's instruments in, in various areas of uh, we are active in, whether international conventions or model laws. So again, uh, kudos to Paraguay and uh, so glad to be uh, taking part in an event in Paraguay um, even if it's only remotely, but Paraguay is really a, a very important uh, model country for us. Um, thank also to the inclusion of ANSITRAL text into the, the moot problems that are prepared by Stefan Kröll and his uh, two colleagues uh, every year. Students and young legal practitioners around the world become familiar with our texts. For example, the, the Willem C. This moot um, has included ANSIFAL texts on international arbitration, the ANSIFAL model law on international commercial arbitration, and more recently, and we hope that this will be a, an ongoing trend, the ANSIFAL rules on transparency, and of course, the CISG, which is the uh, United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods that is at the the core of the, of the, uh, the moot problems. Um, I would also like to take advantage of these, um, these introductory words to make a bit of publicity for our forthcoming Ancitral Lap Days um, from, uh, and uh, to, to, to make uh, some publicity, first of all, for the uh, pre-Lap um, pre Days event that will be organized jointly with ASADIP and where we will have the opportunity to introduce for a broader uh, group of, of participants uh, what ANSITRAL does and, and where, um, where ANSITRAL's work is currently focused. And also uh, on the 9th and 10th of November, the National University of Paraguay will be offering a series of events uh, that form part of these ANSITRAL LAC days. This year, the topic for the ANSITRAL LAC day is transparency, uh, transparency in international investor state arbitration. But no doubt it will also have a, a resonance on um, international commercial arbitration. Um, and I think that this, these lab days will be a great opportunity for uh, to, to showcase how students and young professionals can familiarize themselves with our work on arbitration and of course on, also on transparency. Now, I wanted to say a few words about our coordinating work um, with um, organizations active in international trade law and how we, um, our coordinating role also includes uh, joining forces to find legal solutions to emerging challenges in international trade. 
And if you allow me, I'm going to take an example uh, that has been very relevant um, in uh, developing new areas of work um, for the Commission and ranging from legal issues arising out of the digital economy, because we are really at the juncture of going from electronic commerce into digital trade, which, uh, which is much more automated and when there is less and less uh, human intervention. And also uh, we, we have joined forces with various organizations in uh, the uh, COVID-19 response and recovery uh, work that we have been uh, conducting over the summer and that we presented to the Commission um, during, the, uh, during the 2020 session. Uh, on UNSTRA text and COVID-19 related response and recovery, uh, it's fair to say that uh, of course COVID-19 is not only an alarming global health crisis, but also the cause of extensive social and economic disruptions and uh, the economic fallout is uh, unfortunately only at its beginning and we, we, we can only expect that it will be severe and that it will have a great impact, um, great negative impact. And of course these economic disruptions call for interventions to try to mitigate the effects of the pandemic now but also see how uh, in uh, commercial activity and global trade, um, we can facilitate recovery and help to revitalize these commercial sectors that have been hit very badly, particularly those related to transportation, those relating to trade finance that have been, uh, um, and of course MSMEs that are hit in their, in their flesh uh, on a daily basis. So, during the 2020 Commission session, uh, our member states observed that many of the legislative tools that have been developed by UNCTRA could play an important role in assisting them in their economic response and recovery efforts, and also looking further towards uh, strengthening or building some resilience um, as what we have experienced now and we've seen that the, the entire world has come to a stop is something that we, we cannot afford to happen again. Um, during this uh, session, we partnered with the Vienna International Arbitration Center in the organization of webinars on the COVID impact on international dispute resolution. And we heard from uh, arbitral institutions uh, what was their response to the COVID crisis and how they assess the short-term consequences. Um, most of the institutions, um, most of the arbitration institutions around the globe have taken very innovative measures, ranging from ensuring the safe operation of institutions to um, establishing effective administration of arbitral proceedings. This can be done, of course, through using digital technology uh, which is the, I would say, the more, more exciting part of it. But it's also important to note that a lot of the, um, the um, measures that have been put in place by these institutions could be set, uh, put in place, such as, for example, the use of electronic signature on awards, which is something that wasn't happening before you, before, um, from my experience as arbitrator, we, we circulated a, a white paper that was signed by, by each arbitrator in turn. Now we can use electronic signature, we can use um, electronic uh, dematerialized uh, documents, we can, we can uh, rely on electronic communications and all of this thanks to the standards set by Ancitral in electronic commerce, but that also spill over in the, into the, the business reality, uh, including in dispute resolution. We've also discussed with experts the long-term consequence of the pandemic and how international dispute resolution might evolve in uh, the future. And there were a number of highlights, particularly the increased digitization, further use of technology, uh, a need to be 
able to expedite procedures, the use of artificial intelligence, uh, asynchronous hearings, the role online platforms can offer. And all of this, um, I, I would like to say, we will have to watch very carefully because uh, there is still a need to preserve the fundamental principles of international arbitration. And I know that my friend uh, Stefan will be talking about party autonomy and um, discretion provided to the tribunals conducting these proceedings. This is something that will have to be preserved in spite, I would say, or alongside the developments of more uh, digital technology in international arbitration. So that's one of the aspects I wanted to share with you. Um, and uh, what I also can say in the area of uh, dispute resolution is, of course, that what we've seen and what we, we continue to assess, of course, is that uh, our texts on dispute resolution, including on mediation, are, in our view, flexible enough to accommodate these changing circumstances. But we will have to look at them very closely in the context of this evolving um, environment. And one of the proposals that was made uh, to ANSIC Parts Commission uh, this uh, autumn, the, the second part of the commission that took place in September, was precisely to, uh, it was a proposal by the government of Japan uh, to look into um, the, um, the impact of uh, COVID-19 disruptions on, um, on uh, ADR, on, uh, on arbitration and mediation, and uh, see how we can benefit from these technological advances uh, and at the same time preserve uh, what is the essence of international arbitration. Now, very briefly, because you haven't uh, joined to listen to me, but rather to uh, Stefan Kroll, um, we, we had in 2018 uh, a mandate for working group two. This is our working group on dispute resolution to take up issues related to expedited arbitration. I wanted to share with you that this working group has made great progress in preparing draft provisions um, on expedited arbitration that are expected to be uh, presented to the Commission for adoption in 2021. Uh, we're crossing fingers that we will be able to finish uh, uh, as, as we did um, uh, online in, in the, at the beginning of next year. Uh, we have also, we're also going to present in 2021 the mediation rules and the notes on organizing and mediation which had uh, been expected to be adopted by the commission this year, but we couldn't do that because we did not, uh, because of the uh, pandemic and the fact that we couldn't hold in-person meetings, we refrained from the adoption or the discussion of any legislative work because it was found that this, this online format was not conducive to the adoption not, not to working on, but to the adoption of uh, legislative texts. Um, we, we have this proposal that was made by Japan, as I mentioned, on stock taking of dispute resolution in the modern context. Uh, we have also received a proposal uh, for um, uh, to, to go further into um, high-tech dispute settlement, um, this being closely related also to the exploratory work we are carrying out currently on the digital economy, the legal issues uh, of the digital economy, and how artificial intelligence uh, in, in trade and for trade um, can uh, come handy uh, or, or can, can impact uh, what we currently know uh, in, in terms of dispute resolution. Uh, as I mentioned, online dispute resolution is also an, an, an aspect that we will be looking into more closely. On the legal aspects um, of the digital economy, very briefly, uh, we started exploratory work uh, two years ago. We conducted a number of uh, 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 um, 
meetings, uh, expert meetings, webinars, and uh, one of the, uh, the important uh, outcomes was that uh, we should look into our uh, instruments to ensure that they are future proof and that they can withstand this, this uh, new um, move into the digital era. And that will be one of our uh, challenges in the, in the months to come. And um, we also looked uh, more closely into, um, uh, uh, into fine tuning uh, our work on dispute resolution and, and online platforms uh, for, for that aspect. And as I expressed at the beginning of uh, these opening remarks, our commission playing a coordinating role within the United Nations I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Ansikali is working closely with UNIDRO in the preparation of a um, 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 sort of a, a glossary of um, of all matters uh, relevant to um, to the um, uh, digital economy and to digital trade, and we also try to be closely involved in a roadmap for digital cooperation that was presented by the United Nations Secretary General in June of this year. So uh, without uh, further details, because I, I don't want to, to bore you with details and to deprive you from a very interesting uh, intervention by Stefan Kroll on party autonomy, let me just conclude by saying how glad I am that we can all be um, joining together in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, thank again uh, the organizers, uh, be it uh, Jose uh, and Veronica, and all those who are behind the scene making this possible. Uh, wish you very fruitful deliberations and look forward to our next work uh, episode of work together in Paraguay and uh, more broadly with the Antifrau Lack Days. Thank you very much and uh, over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and the invitation of coming to Paraguay. Uh, I consider that to be a standing invitation that whenever COVID is over, I can still come to Paraguay. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to speak about limits to party autonomy in international arbitration at the 20th anniversary of CEDEP. Um, having seen the CEDEP teams participating in the Bismuth, I know what type of work you do there. And it was always very impressive to see their performance. And also we, the one of the worst experience we had in the mood when we had to tell Asuncion that we made a terrible mistake uh, that we announced them to be in the final rounds, but there was a mistake and the way you took it, there was really sportsmanship. Yeah. Uh, so that for that reason, it's a great pleasure for me to talk about these topics. And I'm also very glad that you decided to take a photo of me, which is 10 years old, where I look much younger, had much more hair. Yeah, I very, I appreciate that very much. Let me share my screen with you uh, to discuss the topic I want to discuss today and uh, that is limits to party autonomy in international arbitration and whenever you invite a german to give a talk the first thing the german does is they present an outline and i'm going to discuss with you today first an overview of what party autonomy means in arbitration so we are not looking into the future we're looking into the real basics of arbitration and then discuss several examples of limitations to party autonomy in a kind of uh, structured way where say we started with the referral stage, there I will discuss two examples of arbitrability, then we move on to the arbitration proceedings uh, and there I will discuss examples of limitations concerning the composition of the tribunal and uh, last but not least, I will discuss some limitations concerning the review concepts in arbitration at the post-award stage. And in the end, I hope to be able to tell you why I selected all that and come up with some conclusions which 
uh, make the presentation look coherent uh, with uh, some structure in it. Let's start with party autonomy and arbitration. And when you discuss party autonomy and arbitration, you normally start out with a definition of arbitration because it already shows part the role of party autonomy. And normally you start up with the definition by Gary Bourne and he described arbitration as a process by which the parties consensually submit a dispute to a non-governmental decision maker selected by or for the parties who renders a binding decision, finally resolving the dispute in accordance with neutral adjudicative procedures, affording the parties an opportunity to be heard. You see from the green parts that is in the definition of arbitration, the central role of party autonomy, while the red parts already show you where the limits are and where some of the limits come from. And having the opportunity at least once to show that there's also benefit in having the brief approach of civil law countries not being lengthy, you will find the same, same but much shorter definition in one of our books, which is a little bit dated, where we describe arbitration as a process in which the parties agree, party autonomy, to refer their disputes to one or more neutral persons in lieu of the court system for judicial determination with a binding defect, effect. And when you talk about judicial determination, that normally involves some of the issues which, has, which Gary has spelled out explicitly, for example, the right to be heard and also the right to be treated equally. When you try to put that definition into a graphic of arbitration, you have on the one hand, you have the court system where the dispute normally is located. And then you refer by the arbitration agreement, you remove the dispute from the court system into the realm of arbitration. Once it's there, it's then for the parties to initiate the arbitration, to select the tribunal, organize their procedure, decide what law is applicable to the merits, and then an award is rendered. And then from that stage, it's then, sorry, it's then moved back again into the realm of the court system, the state court system at the control stage where you need either enforcement of the arbitral award by the state courts or whether you want to control the award before it can be enforced. So when we look at the Ancetron model or what it means concerning party autonomy, you have already at the referral stage, you have elements of party autonomy. It is the arbitration agreement which requires a state court to refer the parties to arbitration because otherwise the state court has to deny jurisdiction or at least stay the proceedings. And you will find regulation of that in Article A7 and 8. When you have the initiation of the arbitration proceedings, again, the model law in Article 21 largely says that it's the parties who determine which dispute is referred to arbitration. Not everything which is covered by the arbitration agreement, but maybe perhaps only parts of that. And it's the parties who initiate the arbitration and determine its scope by this initiation. Then moving on to the tribunal. Again, the answer trial model law provides for party autonomy. Article 10 allows you to determine the number of arbitrators. Article 11 allows you to determine the mode of, mode of appointments. Do you want one, three, or even more arbitrators? Do you want to appoint them themselves or have a third party appointing them? Who is appointing the chairman? All that is submitted to party autonomy. The same applies to the arbitration procedure. Article 19 is clear that in principle, with very few limitations, the parties are free to agree on the procedure. And that's actually one of the big advantages of arbitration. One of the big, uh, or one of the reasons for the success of arbitration, that both in relation to the tribunal and in relation to the arbitration procedure, the parties are free to draft the proceedings and to appoint the tribunal in a way which is most suitable for the dispute. And then also concerning the merits, you are completely free in selecting not only the law applicable to the contract and to the merits, 
but also perhaps the rules of law. And we just heard from Andre Bain Ray that they are working closely with UNIDRA. And you in arbitration, you may also select the UNIDRA principles on international contracts. And when the award has been rendered, then at that stage, you have some control. And when you look at the control mechanism, there are two mechanisms for control. The first one is at the place of arbitration, the setting aside proceedings, which are normally initiated by the losing party, the party unhappy with the award. If they are successful, the award is set aside and that setting aside will constitute a defense in subsequent enforcement proceedings all over the world. And already at that stage, you look at some of the limitations of party autonomy, which I will discuss in greater detail a little later. And the second also at least implied control at the place of enforcement are the defenses against enforcement. Usually the enforcement action is initiated by the winning party. And if the court declares the award enforceable or recognizes it, it has the same value as a state court judgment. If it's not successful in case of domestic award, then very often the award will be set aside at the same time. In case of foreign award, at that stage, the courts will declare the award non-enforceable in that particular jurisdiction. That does not prevent you from trying to enforce it in another jurisdiction. This is the basic setup of arbitration. And this is how party autonomy plays a role in this setup. So now let's have a look at the limits to party autonomy. And you will find limits everywhere at the referral stage, during the arbitration stage, as well as the control stage. And when you look at the limits, the most important limitations are at the arbitration stage, because these limitations will have an influence also how arbitration is perceived. If you take away a lot of the opportunities for the parties to determine and to select the arbitrators, and if you take away the opportunity to draft the arbitration procedure the way they want to, you have taken away one of the big advantages of arbitration. And the limits in particular to arbitration procedure and the limits to the arbitration tribunal are coming from the due process requirements in the national law. The control stage is at the referral stage where under Article 2 of the New York Convention as a kind of model, there are a number of control points where it's the courts may de deviate from the agreement of the parties to refer the dispute to arbitration by saying the arbitration agreement is null and void, inoperative or in incapable of being performed, and also by considering the dispute to be non-arbitrable. So let me first deal with the questions of at the referral stage, limitations to party autonomy at the referral stage. When you look at the referral stage, the most important limitation, the most important obvious limitation is the non-arbitrability of a dispute. You could also consider the writing requirements for the arbitration agreement to be a limitation. You could also consider some of the uh, null and void agreements to be a limitation. But the most obvious one is the non-arbitrability. Even if the parties want to refer certain disputes to arbitration, the state courts may prevent them from doing that. So where do you find the limits to arbitrability? Again, that is primary in the national laws which define arbitrability. And through these national laws, arbitrability also becomes a limited party autonomy at the arbitration stage, because the tribunal has some say an ex officio obligation to determine whether a dispute is arbitrable before it can hear the case. At the referral stage, New York Convention allows the state courts to hear the case if the dispute isn't arbitrable. 
And at the, sorry, at the post-award stage, we have Article 5 to b as a defense that you can refuse enforcement of an award if the dispute is not arbitrable. So now here, let's have a look at the limits imposed by the national laws on arbitrability. If you look at the Antitrust model law, it clearly mentions in Article 5.1 that this law shall not affect other laws of the states by virtue of this certain disputes may not be submitted to arbitration or may be submitted to arbitration only in according to provisions other than those of this law. So the drafters of the Antitrust model law refrained from determining arbitrability themselves. They just said there is a concept which will not be affected by the provision of this law. And in Article 34, dealing with the post-award stage, the setting aside of an award, they have a conflict of law provision which says an arbitral award may be set aside if the subject matter of the dispute is not capable of settlement by arbitration under the law of this state, meaning the state where the arbitration was heard, and you have a comparable provision for the enforcement of arbitral awards in Article 36, and again, it's the place of enforcement. So it's normally the place where you want to hear the case. And when you look at the modern concept of arbitrability, arbitrability contains limitation, which rests normally on the, that, on the idea that some matters so pervasively involve public rights and concerns or affect the interests of third parties that only the government or the state courts can resolve these disputes. They're reserved for the state courts. So how are different laws dealing with that? In principle, you have two types of laws. The first one contains no specific regulation in, uh, in uh, the national law. And they rely on general principles. A typical example is the United States, where the case law has developed principles to determine when a dispute is arbitral or not. And the basic idea is, unless there is a clear statement by the legislator, by Congress, that certain disputes are not arbitrable, they are considered to be arbitrable. Then you have a group of countries which have a kind of general rule referring to public interest, public policy, whatever, or uh, referring certain disputes to the exclusive jurisdiction of the state courts. And the last category of countries, you have a special rule, which has some general principles um, and then has certain exceptions somewhere else. And these certain exceptions are then usually based on particular principles going back either to the pervasive interests of the state or the, uh, that third parties are affected. So when you look at the laws in some more detail, you will find the following concepts. You have jurisdictions like Switzerland and Germany, um, sorry, you have jurisdictions like, for example, Italy, where the arbitrability is directly connected with the question of, can you settle a particular claim directly connected with party autonomy under substantive law? Then you have jurisdictions like Germany and Switzerland, which go a step further. And they say, whenever the claim involves an economic interest, irrespective of whether you can reach a settlement under substantive law, then the dispute is arbitrable. So there is a difference between party autonomy at the substantive law side and party autonomy at the procedural law side, with the procedural law side being a little bit broader due to the involvement of a neutral decision maker. And then you have jurisdictions like Singapore, where they refer to public policy, or the UK public interest, or the United States, where you have a kind of balancing of interest. And last but not least, you have jurisdictions where the rules providing for exclusive jurisdiction of the courts are considered to be restrictions on the party's ability to refer the disputes to arbitration. So these are the various limitations. Now let's have a look at some of the concerned areas where limitations to party autonomy concerning arbitrability exist. And the first one is competition and antitrust law. It has been 
an issue in a num numerous jurisdictions. You have the famous Mitsubishi Supreme Court decision by uh, the United States Supreme Court. Uh, but you still have from last year a decision by the Chinese Supreme Court, which says that antitrust law, private claims under antitrust law are not arbitrable. You have security transactions and you have, and that is one of the area where I'm looking a little bit closer to, you have sole distributorship disputes. You have intellectual property right disputes where the issue is the validity or invalidity of the intellectual property right, which are considered in numerous jurisdictions to be non-arbitrable. You have questions of illegality and fraud, bribery and corruption, which may be considered to be non-arbitrable or where there are at least limitations to arbitrability in some jurisdictions. And you have corporate and company law disputes, which will be the second example I'm looking at in some more detail uh, under numerous jurisdictions. And another example are insolvency disputes. Again, insolvency disputes, you have numerous of creditors involved and therefore there's a limitation. Now let's have a look at the first example, the sole distributorship, protecting the weaker party. And here you have an example, uh, court proceedings initiated by the distributor. The principal invokes the arbitration agreement. And if the dispute is in Belgium, there's a special act which says these disputes are not arbitrable. It's the Belgian Distribution Act. You have a comparable situation in Italy where also these type of disputes are considered to be non-arbitrable. If you have the same dispute in Germany, it looks a little different. And there's an example from the higher region court in Munich which shows you how the Germans approach it. You had an agreement between a chip producer in the United States and a distributor in Germany. And it provided for distribution in Germany and Austria. The dispute resolution clause contained, provided for AAA arbitration in California, plus one of these pathological case, cases, all disputes by the courts shall be decided by the courts in Santa Barbara and it provided for the application of Californian law. What happened? The chip producer terminated the contract at a particular time. And then the German distributor started proceedings in Germany for compensation under the German commercial code, though the parties had selected Californian law to be applicable. And to understand that, this provision of the German commercial code dates back to a European directive. And under that directive, whenever a distribution agreement is terminated, the distributor has a claim for compensation. The claim for compensation is there to compensate the distributor for the loss of the opportunity to gain commission on contracts which the uh, principal now concludes with customers which have originally been brought by the distributor. So under German law for the next year, all, the, all contracts included by the chip producers with German customers which have originally been brought by the distributors, they are taken into account for the calculation of the compensation. And this provision or the European origin of that has been determined by the European Court of Justice to be an overriding mandatory provision. That means it applies irrespective of what law the parties have chosen. However, in the present case, it was clear that the dispute is arbitrable because under German law, these type of disputes are arbitrable because they involve an economic interest and there's no provision which expressly excludes it. So the German courts could not it state that the dispute is non-arbitrable. What they came, they came to the conclusion that the combination of the choice of law clause plus the forum selection or the arbitration clause meant that this arbitration clause was invalid because the courts in California, the arbitration tribunal in California would apply Californian law and would not apply the European law. What is the difference to the first example? The difference to the first example is 
that in principle, the dispute may be referred to arbitration and only once it is in the arbitration realm, you look at the validity and the enforceability of the arbitration agreement. And you see immediately the difference when you look at if the American party had initiated arbitration proceedings and the American arbitrator would have said, we are looking at the European overriding mandatory provision, though in principle, Californian law is applicable, that would have dealt with a problem which the German courts addressed when they heard the case by saying the arbitration agreement is invalid. So that is the second approach. They are valid, but you somehow limit the validity of the, uh, sorry, they are arbitrable, but you somehow limit the validity of the arbit and enforceability of the arbitration agreement. And the last approach was selected by the famous Mitsubishi versus Solar decision by the American Supreme Court. It's normally known for its competition law effects. I'm just looking now not at the competition law effects, I want to look more at the structure of the approach taken by the, European, uh, by the American Supreme Court. In that case, you had a contract between Mitsubishi Motors, a Japanese corporation and Solar Chrysler Plymouth that was a Puerto Rican dealer. And the agreements provided for arbitration in Japan and the agreement was supposed to be governed by Swiss law. What happened in that case that Mitsubishi delivered cars to solar, solar didn't pay due to an economic crisis. They asked for the permission from Mitsubishi to re-export the cars to a different country because they tried to, they had the idea they could sell them there. Mitsubishi refused to do that and then wanted to bring an action for the payment of the outstanding amounts. And that action normally should have gone to arbitration in Japan. But at the time, it was standard practice in the US that this competition law disputes or everything which involved a competition law element was not arbitrable. For that reason, Mitsubishi decided to play it safe and went to the American courts first, asking to refer solar to arbitration in Japan, hoping by that decision they would know from the beginning, will they accept arbitration in Japan or not? So they started the action in the US trying an order to compel arbitration. But what Solar did, they brought a counterclaim and raised inter alia claims, statutory claims under the Sherman Act. And under the Sherman Act, that is the competition law of United States, uh, someone who has been prevented in its competitive behavior through an agreement by another party can ask for damages. So now the counterclaim was standing there and the American Supreme Court had to decide, can we refer the dispute to arbitration or is it non-arbitrable as was the position before the Mitsubishi case? And what the American Supreme Court did, and that is the interesting part is, the American Supreme Court adopted an approach saying, we believe that arbitration is of the same quality like state court proceedings. So we refer you first to arbitration then you have the arbitration. We see whether the Japanese arbitrators take into account the American Sherman Act claims. And then when the award comes back to us at the post-award stage, then we only control it. So we give the arbitrators the chance to make the dispute arbitrable, or at least to apply the American, uh, American competition law rules in an appropriate way. So we have three different approaches to the same problem. The Belgians say there is no, valid, uh, there is no uh, arbitrability of the dispute. The Germans, which say in principle, the disputes are arbitrable, but from an ex ante point of view, we say that the arbitration agreement is not enforceable. And the Americans, which give much more weight to party autonomy and say, we first refer the parties to arbitration, we see whether the arbitrator gets it right. And if they get it right, we are not interfering. Otherwise, we control it at the post award stage. So three different approaches, all enforcing certain limits to party autonomy. Let me come to the, my second example, the company law or corporate law disputes. 
The corporate law disputes have a number of particularities. They involve very often protective mandatory rules for minority shareholders or for creditors. They very often have special form requirement for transparency questions. They very often involve multi-party situations with several shareholders involved. And very often these multi-party situations require a uniform decision. You cannot have different opposing decisions, for example, concerning a shareholders meeting decision. And therefore, in a lot of jurisdictions, you have rules on exclusive jurisdiction for these type of corporate disputes. And last but not least, there is what you could call a lack of actual consent of all shareholders, because very often you have a majority decision, which is binding also of the shareholders, which never agreed to submit to arbitration. So what are the possible reactions again to impose certain limits upon party autonomy? Again, the first one is you generally exclude these company or disputes from arbitration to consider them to be non-arbitrable. Second approach, you consider certain of the disputes of particular interest for the government to be non-arbitrable. And you have that approach, for example, in the new Russian law, while the old Russian law, or at least the Russian case law, followed the first approach. And the last approach, which you can compare with the American approach concerning the arbitrability of sole distributorship agreements, is to consider these disputes to be generally arbitrable, but you require specific requirements for the enforcement of the arbitration agreement. So let me exemplify that this time with the rules in Germany. In Germany, you have no special rules relating to the arbitration of company law. So in general, the arbitration law is applicable and these disputes are arbitrable under the relevant section of German arbitration law, which says or any, any claim involving economic interest can be subject of an arbitration agreement. And this company law disputes all involve economic interest. So there is, however, one major problem concerning the disputes relating to decisions taken at a shareholder meeting. If one of the parties, if one of the shareholders is unhappy with these decisions, they may try to attack it. If they attack it in the state courts, there is no problem because these decisions are either valid or invalid against every shareholder. In the state courts, every shareholder can participate in these proceedings. And there is a provision which says any decision rendered in these type of state court proceedings has an ergo omnes effect, means is binding all shareholders. So. If the shareholder decision is declared invalid, then this will bind all shareholders. The problem in arbitration is you have one shareholder bringing in action against the company, the asking for a declaration that this shareholder resolution is invalid. This shareholder will appoint its arbitrator. This shareholder may perhaps exclude all other shareholders by not informing them. So we have a problem here that the erga omnes approach or the erga omnes effect, which is guaranteed by the applicable law in state court proceedings may not be suitable in arbitration. And due to that problem, we had at the beginning a Supreme Court decision by the German Supreme Court called arbitrability number one, where they said, these type of disputes are not arbitrable. It was a misleading decision because when you looked at the decision itself, not at the official headline, the court considered the disputes to be arbitrable and merely said, we cannot enforce the arbitration agreement. That was changed by a second decision of the German Supreme Court of 2009, Arbitrability 2 where they clearly spelled out that the shareholder resolution disputes are arbitrable if arbitration agreement fulfills certain requirements. And the requirements are, you must contractually ensure that there's an ergo omnes effect by an option for all shareholders to participate meaningfully in an arbitration. And second, you must make sure that there are no conflicting decisions about the same shareholder resolution. If you cannot do that by the arbitration agreement, 
then the arbitration agreement is either invalid or non-enforceable according to German law. Because it's considered to be then contrary to public policy. And the underlying rationale is you cannot bind a person under constitutional law whose legal rights are affected, who had no possibility to participate in an arbitration. So you're now left with a situation that in your arbitration agreement, you have to ensure these requirements. And when you look at the requirements, there were four requirements imposed. The first one was consent of all shareholders to, arb to the arbitration agreement. Second, an opportunity for all shareholders to participate. Third, equal influence on the constitution of the tribunal. And last but not least, concentration of all proceedings before the same tribunal. Drafting an arbitration agreement which fulfills all these requirements is very difficult. So what can you do? You hope that there is someone else, another player in the market, which helps you by drafting that, by just providing specific rules which guarantee that. And that is what happened in Germany by special rules by the German arbitration institution. They have special supplementary rules for corporate law disputes. And these, these supplementary rules, what they do, they provide in, on several pages rules which guarantee or which ensure that everyone can participate, that the tribunal is appointed not by the party which initiated the arbitration, but by the institution, and that everyone else is agreeing by signing the arbitration agreement that they are bound by the award coming out of that. So in principle, they model it on a contractual basis. So again, different approaches. And here you have the help of the arbitration institution, which helps you to reduce the limits imposed on party autonomy by external requirements. Let me come to the second example, the constitution of the tribunal concerning the number of arbitrators. The answer to our model law says, in principle, you are free to determine the number of arbitrators. Failing such a determination, the number of arbitrators shall be three. When you look at the French law, which is normally very arbitration friendly, they impose a certain limitation there. They state that in principle, a tribunal shall, shall be composed of a sole arbitrator or an uneven number of arbitrators. If you agree on an even number of arbitrators, the French law requires an additional arbitrator shall be appointed. What is the underlying rationale? If you have an even number, there's always the threat of a non-agreement between the arbitrators, that there is a deadlock between the arbitrators and that you will not end up with a decision. So the French trying to improve the efficiency of arbitration, guaranteeing that in the end there will be a decision, final award, they opted for limitation on party autonomy. And then there's a, the same idea is underlying the Egyptian arbitration law. But the Egyptians went a step further. They're not appointing an additional arbitrator. They say in Article 15 of the Egyptian arbitration law that the tribunal must consist of an odd number on the penalty of nullity. Again, the idea is we want to avoid arbitration agreements which may not operate in practice due to an even number and a deadlock. However, the Egyptians went a step further and said, if you do that, this arbitration agreement is invalid, perhaps hoping to induce the parties to draft an arbitration agreement, which is guaranteed. That is the first example concerning the number of arbitrators. Then the second example, selecting the arbitrators. Also, again, you have a freedom for selecting arbitrators under the model law. However, the model law contains some minimum requirements concerning the person of the arbitrator, which impose limits on your party autonomy. The arbitrator must be independent and impartial. You cannot appoint an arbitrator which lacks that quality. Even if the parties have agreed upon that, it is difficult to appoint this arbitrator. You have, for example, under the IBA guidelines uh, on conflict of interest, 
you have the non waiver red list where an agreement by the parties will not supersede the limits of party autonomy imposed by the requirements of independence and impartiality. How is that normally safeguarded, that requirement? You have a right to challenge an arbitrator, which does not, ref does not have these uh, requ um, requirements, and you may challenge an award or resist its enforcement if you find out only later that the arbitrator lacked the necessary independence or impartiality. That is the constitution of the tribunal. However, we have a decision again by a German Supreme Court going a step further. That involved a multi million dollar private partnership agreement between the government and a contractor for the construction of several hospitals. And the dispute resolution clause provided for what they called a contract advisory board. And concerning the contract advisory board, it stated that the employer and the contractor will each appoint two members. Both parties will nominate their CEOs and their technical directors or project directors for the board. And then the last, the four members of this board shall appoint the president of the board and the president should be someone having the qualification of a judge. And the arbitration agreement clearly, or the agreement clearly provided that this is an arbitration agreement. So the parties wanted arbitration. A decision was rendered. And when they tried to enforce that decision, though none of the parties pleaded that, the German Supreme Court said, this is not even an arbitration agreement. This is something beyond arbitration. The arbitration requires that you have a neutral body, decision-making body. Even if the parties want to have this as an arbitral tribunal, this is not an arbitral tribunal. So they deduced from the obligation existing under the law that there must be a neutral person there. They deduced the prohibition that you can have your CEO sitting in an arbitral tribunal. Again, that is a decision which you could have also rendered differently. You could have looked at the president there, which was a neutral person. You could have said, we look at the possibility of challenging the arbitrator and consider that to be sufficiently um, protective. The German Supreme Court in that case clearly stated this is not enough. And then we have another one, I'm not referring to that, that's Siemens Dutco, where there's a limitation imposed by the requirement of equal treatment of the parties, but in the interest of time, I move on to last limitation coming now from the High Court in Singapore or from the rules of arbitration of the arbitration institution. And here you had a contract between two parties, an oral agreement concerning shipments, and they submitted it to the rules of SIAC. But the arbitration agreement provided that there should be uh, arbitration in accordance with the rules of conciliation arbitration of the Singapore International Arbitration Center by three arbitrators in the English language. So the SIAC rules, however, contained a provision that if there's a small case and you want to expedite the proceedings, SIAC can decide to have a sole arbitrator. So now you had a conflict between the arbitration agreement providing for three arbitrator and SIAC rules, which had been chosen by the parties as well, providing for a sole arbitrator. And SIAC appointed a sole arbitrator. What happened, the sole arbitrator rendered a decision, assumed its jurisdiction, held the supplier liable, and the seller started setting aside proceedings. And they said the procedure was not in line with what the parties had agreed. We did not want a sole arbitrator. We clearly agreed on three member tribunal. So here you have a party autonomy, three arbitrator, limitation opposed by the institutional rules chosen by the parties as well. And the Singapore High Court considered that to be in line with the TIAC rules and therefore there was no set aside of the award. The same disorders, comparable decision 
uh, comparable situation arose in front of a Chinese court and the Chinese court came to the opposite conclusion, came to the conclusion that this is not in line with what the parties had agreed and therefore the award was not enforced. So again, we have here a provision limiting party autonomy to expedite the proceedings to make them more efficient. These were my examples from appointment of arbitrators. Now let's move to the post award control and the question, what limitations exist there? Can you reduce the state control or can you even extend the state control? I'm not looking at the reduction of state control. There are certain findings in the digest concerning the post award control, where we looked at the um, decisions in the model of countries and the idea was there is no complete exclusion is not possible, but there may certain, be certain limitations. More interesting is the part on extending state court control. Can you as tribunal, as party, ask for higher control by the state courts than is provided under the law? And the prevailing view is that is not compatible with arbitration. And they've given di different reasons for that. Let me take one example, this time from New Zealand. There was an arbitration clause which provided for arbitration, but the arbitration clause contained a second paragraph where they said that the parties carry out the award without delay, subject only to such right as they may possess. And then they refer to a provision which allows for a review of the award on questions of law. That is a particularity existing in a number of common law countries. But they extended that to questions of law and fact. So in principle, they opted for a proper appeal in arbitration proceedings. And if you remember the uh, definition of arbitration I had given at the beginning, it said arbitration in lieu of the state courts. And here it's not in lieu of the state courts, but you refer to the state courts in the end as a kind of appeal procedure. And the Court of Appeal in New Zealand and the Court of the Supreme Court both considered that part to be invalid, to be beyond party autonomy. And they argued in a way, not that this is contrary to arbitration as an institution, but they argued in a way that it's not up for the parties to determine in which cases the state courts can interfere. So it's a little bit more the organizational argument, parties have no party autonomy in describing in which actions or which action state courts may take. You have comparable decisions in the United States in Hall Street versus Mattel. The Supreme Court also considered such clauses to be invalid. And then we have a different approach and a different approach this time coming from the German Supreme Court. Again, you had two parties which did not want to be bound by an arbitration award, which they considered to be utterly wrong. So in that case, we had a provision, arbitration provision, which said we go to arbitration under the rules of the German institution of arbitration. But then in the second paragraph said, the result of the arbitration may be recognized by both parties and final and, uh, final and binding. If one of the parties is not content with the outcome of the arbitration, it has to initiate court proceedings within one month after having received the award. In case of non-compliance with this time limit, the award will be final and binding for both parties. So here it's not a proper appeal, but the parties try to reach the same result by taking a different road. They took the road saying the award only becomes binding if we do not initiate court proceedings, if we initiate court proceedings, there is no binding decision by the arbitral tribunal. If I'm unhappy with the award, I may avoid that award. So that is this time the parties trying to avoid limitations on party autonomy. Now I've given you a number of examples which may not look completely coherent. I try to make them a little bit more coherent in the conclusions. When you look at my conclusions, party autonomy is firmly recognized as a governing principle. Arbitration is based on party autonomy. In light of that, the 
wording limitations to party autonomy has a kind of negative connotation to that. You are taking away something which is essential to arbitration. However, when you look at some of the limitations imposed, they may actually serve very useful purposes. They serve, they protect very important interests. They may protect vital interests of the state by limiting or by guaranteeing that they can protect weaker parties. They may protect due process by ensuring that there is no um, biased arbitrator. They may also protect the parties if they are weaker parties there, and they may protect the third party interest. All these protections are helping to legitimize arbitration. If we wouldn't have this protection, legit, le, the, sorry, the legitimacy of arbitration would be under serious threat. I'm not sure whether the protections for the efficiency of the proceedings are really justified, the limitations imposed for these protections. So, for example, when I take the French and the Egyptian rules concerning the number of arbitrators, if the parties want to appoint two arbitrators, I wouldn't adopt a paternalistic approach. If the parties go for three arbitrators, I wouldn't say to make it more efficient, we have a sole arbitrator appointed under our rules. And there's a second thing you probably take from that class. The extent of the limitations differ. You have a certain objective by imposing these limitations. But when looking at the rules, how you try to protect the interest, how the Americans try to protect it uh, in the Mitsubishi solar case and how the Belgians and Germans try to protect it, there's a difference in limitation. And whenever you as a legislator are reconsidering doing something, maybe it's a good idea to look at other jurisdictions to see whether they reach the same objective by means which may not limit party autonomy in a way you used to limit party autonomy. And second, there's also a possibility for the parties to reduce the effects of the limitation. Take the German example. If you'd want to ensure that there's someone, a state court later on looking at your arbitral award, looking at uh, the content of an arbitral award, you can perhaps try by proper drafting your arbitration clause to avoid the limitations imposed by Wall Street and Carworth versus Galloway, saying that you cannot have a court actually reviewing the arbitral decision, but you may have a non-binding arbitral decision. There's a tendency to give more way, more room for party autonomy. I hope there is no backlash from investment arbitration, where you have a considerable limitation now on party autonomy um, due to the negative perception of investment arbitration. But that is probably something which the CDIP or CEDEP may discuss at the 30th anniversary. Thank you very much for your attention. It's long enough that I kept you listening to myself. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this very clear presentation. Yeah, indeed, you deserve a, a cheers from the, from the participants. It has been um, very clear, as I said, and I thank you very much for uh, accepting of our invitation of going virtual because you were supposed to come to Asuncion uh, and, and you have, in fact, an irrevocable offer uh, to visit Asuncion whenever this uh, COVID uh, issue disappears. So hopefully we will uh, have you soon with us here and, and thank you very much really for, for uh, being part of this uh, uh, 20th anniversary uh, commemoration of, of CEDEP today. And I just wanted to say that the sportsmanship paid off uh, because uh, from the ashes, the, the Asuncion team uh, returned to Vienna next year and made it to the final round. So uh, that was something also that uh, we were very, very glad that the, that the team held its temper and, and really uh, uh, excelled uh, next year. 
The, the majority of the questions uh, posed in advance have been already answered by you. Uh, participants have already had the chance of, of sending some questions and you already addressed many of them. Um, I want to turn out now to Veronica. Uh, if you have any, any, any comments or questions, Veronica, that you may want to pose now. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Stefan, for that fantastic uh, uh, dissertation indeed uh, on, on limits to party autonomy. I thought it was an uh, incredible reach in terms of, of its content. So thank you very much for that. I have a question and actually a comment in relation to something that also Anne Joven mentioned in relation to uh, widening participation and inclusivity uh, in, in ancestral work. But um, also we heard about that uh, from our former president of ASA Deep in, in webinars that the OAS has been organizing uh, in relation to the future of arbitration itself as in further inclusion as a, as a key issue. And uh, thinking about the example you put in relation to uh, this distributorship case in Germany and the way that actually the arbitral agreement was attacked at, or actually the validity of the arbitral agreement was the way of going round about protecting weaker parties. My question is in relation to that, in a way, um, vision of arbitration as more accessible to all and the opportunities out there to make it uh, more inclusive as a dispute resolution mechanisms and then the ways of protecting what is so core and central uh, to to international arbitration as you just said uh, party autonomy and what are the means of doing this by ways of protecting arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism in that sense not um going against uh, you know I, I think the, the example that you put of how the German courts dealt with that protection of the weaker party through um, considering the arbitral agreement invalid is something that uh, addresses a, a concern from from an arbitration point of view so I, I would like to hear your thoughts of how how to protect the weaker parties in a way that also doesn't pose a, a risk uh, for the dispute resolution mechanism itself. As I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of the German solution there. I think the American solution in that regard is much better um, because you have to strike a balance somehow. Also, the weaker party is participating as a business operator in the business. If they agree to arbitration, yes, they should in principle be held to the arbitration and I would first want to see the arbitrator deciding the case and see whether the arbitrator, and that is his or her task in looking at protecting the party, taking into account these mandatory provisions which protect the weaker party, even if the parties have selected a different law. Uh, for me, it would be the arbitrator's task of doing that. And then the courts could then at the post-award stage say, okay, we're not enforcing the award, we are not considering it to have res judicata effect if the weaker party says they have not looked at it and I want to have a second go at that. But for me, the absolute protection of the weaker party of saying we kick out the arbitration agreement considered to be invalid, though they have agreed to that agreement at the beginning, is not, is not what I would suggest. And probably have seen that I'm not a fan of paternalistic approaches. Yeah? For me, I start off with the assumption if the parties agree on something and they are business operators, they should be bound and they should be held to the agreement uh, if at all possible. I'm not a big fan of consumer arbitration at the same time, uh, because I think party autonomy always requires that you have two parties which at least operate on a largely equal level or at least operate above a minimum threshold of informational uh, this quality uh, and therefore if you would ask me concerning consumer arbitration I would have a completely different view. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for the answer and thank you again for, for your uh, fantastic uh, uh, conference today. I, I, on behalf of Asadeep I, I'm very I'm very grateful uh, indeed. Thank you Veronica and Professor just one last question before before you go. Uh, there, there was a. Um, it's from the from the audience, from the, one of the participants. What are the challenges uh, of 
choosing non-state law regarding uh, the topic that you addressed today. Uh, selecting non-state law, as I said, I'm a big fan of party autonomy. And if the parties opted for a non-state law in arbitration, in my view, that should be recognized. And if you look at the Ancetron model law, the Ancetron model law in Article 28 clearly says you may choose rules of law, not only the state law. And at least the arbitration-friendly uh, jurisdictions, they would all recognize, in my view, or at least to my, in my knowledge, they would recognize these awards if they're based on non-state law, which has been chosen by the parties. And again, arbitration as such is based on party autonomy. And the reason why you're bound as a party by an award and that came out very clearly in the last decision by the German Supreme Court is because it's submitted to arbitration. And it's a completely different reason than being bound by a state court judgment. The state court proceedings are imposed upon you. You have no chance in resisting them and it's not your decision to be submitted to the state court that is imposed by the law. You have no chance in selecting the judges deciding the case and therefore you're bound because the law tells you you're bound. In arbitration, we have a completely different setup. And if you believe in party autonomy, I think you should also believe in party autonomy when it comes to selecting the applicable law. And I'm not aware of any decision which has set aside an award or refused recognition of, of an award where the tribunal applied a non-state law which had been chosen by the parties. If the tribunal applied a non-state law which had not been chosen by the parties, that's completely different. And there are some decisions which go in that direction, so at least indicate that there may be an issue concerning the um, compliance with party autonomy. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, your presentation has been so interesting that I can't believe that uh, an hour and a half left. Uh, it's uh, incredible. So we have been very attentive and it has been a very, very, uh, nice uh, and useful presentation, I'm sure, for, for all the participants. Um, again, I want to thank all the, the supporters of this event, Marianela Bruno from Alcitral, of course, the Secretary, and uh, Anna, and, uh, and uh, of course, ASADIP, the American Association of Private International Law, that uh, we are uh, proud to, to, to also have a to, 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 be, to, to be supporting them in, in, in their efforts. And in particular, Veronica, who has uh, been with us today at this uh, presentation. Um, Stefan, thanks again. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And hopefully we will see you soon in Asuncion. Having um, said that, then uh, I don't know if you want to say some final words and then uh, Carolina uh, will just uh, make an announcement to end the, 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 that would be in Spanish. Stefan? No, thank you very much for having me. And I'm looking forward to my uh, visit in Asuncion. I've seen that in the chat, some people wanted to have the slides. I would send you the slides and you can decide whether you put them up on your webpage or whatever, yeah, or whether you send it to the participants. And thank you to the participants for staying with me for, uh, such a time, long time, and since sitting in front of a computer, that's usually difficult. Uh, I appreciate that at least 50 of you stayed on the computer. Thanks. Thanks again, Stefan. Bye bye. Carolina. Muchas gracias. En nombre del CDEB y ASADIP que han participado de este evento, les queremos invitar a un siguiente que estamos iniciando el 3 de noviembre. Cuestiones prácticas de arbitraje comercial y de inversiones. Van a estar ocho representantes de, del mundo jurídico y arbitral, quienes son Estefanía Ponce, Estefanía Fierro, Agustín Alfaro, Lucía Olavarria, Francisco Groff, Francisco Amayo, Santiago Gatica y Julián Bordajar, acompañándonos en este nuevo curso. Así que les invitamos y muy buenas tardes. Un comentario, Carolina. Uh, Stefan, I just want to say that uh, most of the, of the speakers for, for this event uh, are all uh, former Mutis. Uh, you probably know Santiago Gatica, who was a finalist on behalf of the Universidad de Montevideo some years ago. So now they are all uh, active practitioners and successful 
uh, in their in their law practice. Uh, and thanks uh, to to the to the mood that you so diligently always had. So uh, thanks again for everything. And muchas gracias a todos. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao ciao.